UW360 is proudly supported by Pacific Office Automation, Copy, Print, Workflow, and IT, Problem Solved. Support for UW360 is provided by the Labor Archives of Washington. Learn more about researching at the Labor Archives and donating collections at laborarchives.org. Today on UW360, exploring the history of workers and jobs in the Northwest, a story filled with strikes, spies, even massacres. Plus, something to really crow about. The crow whisperer himself gives us a deeper appreciation for these incredibly smart birds. Also, see how a UW grad transformed his personal struggles into seeds of hope for his fellow veterans. And parents may or may not want to hear this, how playing video games could help pay for your kid's college. Straight ahead on UW360. From the University of Washington, welcome to UW360. Hi everyone, I'm Carolyn Douglas. Did you know the UW Library System is ranked in the top 10 of all public research universities in the country? and that it has more than 5 million users every year? So when it comes to researching life in our region, there is no better place to learn than a UW library, which takes us to one small area of UW Special Collections. It's dedicated to the rich history of the labor movement in the Pacific Northwest. It's devoted to preserving the records of working people back to when there barely even was a Seattle. Today we begin a series with the Labor Archives of Washington, starting with this overview of the history of the labor movement in our state. The sights and sounds are everywhere. Signs that men and women are hard at work, doing the heavy lifting, making our community livable, while also making sure they're working for a living wage, something embedded in our history. Some of the biggest events in Seattle history turn on labor activism. The Seattle General Strike is part of what the world knows about Seattle. These are your streets, this is your town. The WTO demonstrations of 1999, the Battle of Seattle, is known worldwide. The labor movement in the Pacific Northwest started more than a hundred years before that. There were strong unions in the 1880s in this region, and there have been strong unions ever since. And Washington State, and Seattle in particular, has a history that's often bound up with working class struggles, strikes, and the like. Preserving labor history has been a crucial part of the University of Washington libraries for years. There have been labor archives, meaning collections for many years, going back decades and decades. The Labor Archives of Washington is a name that's been given to a sort of upgrading and formalization of the labor archives as a discrete body of archives. To make that happen, the UW Library's Special Collection Division teamed up with Organized Labor, as well as the Harry Bridges Center for Labor Studies, a UW center honoring an important labor activist, Harry Bridges. In San Francisco, Harry Bridges is ordered to jail as a threat to the national security. And I'm an officer of a left-wing trade union, and that's the way those people think, and as long as my rank and file feel that way, my job is to represent them that way. In the spirit of Bridges' commitment to his members, labor men and women ponied up the funds to help create the Labor Archives of Washington starting with hiring an archivist. Almost immediately was able to accomplish wonderful things, bringing in new collections, daylighting collections, working with the labor community around the state. So I'm opening up a box right now. And Hopefully our work is to really preserve it by rehousing it in archival housings, but also to really deepen that access so that it's different than just throwing it in your garage. It's accessible to the public and people can discover it online and really understand what this history contained in these boxes is. So it's a really important part of our memory, of our psychology, of our life, of our culture. Consequently, we need to preserve it. We need to be able to document uh, this part of our history, and that's what the Labor Archives does. Making sure generations to come can learn about the hard work and struggles 
of the men and women before them. It has become uh, really a fantastic resource. You can learn more about preserving this history and also how to donate records by going to the Special Collections page at the UW Library website. Just head to the link on our website at uwtv.org slash uw360. Still ahead on UW360, a pesky problem or a terribly misunderstood creature? We go inside the hidden world of crows. Plus, see how UW students are playing a critical role at our local museums. And later, gaming his way through college. How one UW student's paying for school by playing video games as UW360 continues. The following UW360 story is made possible by the generous support of BECU. BECU, more than just money. Welcome back to UW360. Love them or hate them, crows are some of the most common birds in our neighborhoods and some of the most misunderstood. But that's changing thanks to the work of UW researcher John Marsluff, who's giving the term bird brain a whole new meaning. Stacy Sakamoto reports. They're in our parks. They're always gauging us. Our campuses. So are we going to give them some food or are we going to be a threat to them? And our popular culture. They're certainly one of the most intelligent birds. University of Washington Professor of Wildlife Science John Marsluff has studied crows for three decades. What we found right away was that basically crows exist where people exist. Even in the remote wilderness, it's where there's a campground or something like that. Marsluff's newest research involves studying the brain activity of crows. Researchers in the lab expose the birds to something interesting, like food or the sound of other crows. This bird was looking at food and hearing about food, and so I was noting how often it craned its neck and looked around. Was it swallowing? Did it move its position? Which it did a couple times and swallowed a lot, so it seemed very motivated by the food. No, he's okay, he's getting, he's pretty relaxed. Then the animals are sedated. Let's do it. And their brains are scanned. Really moved his tail when the door opened. So far, it's demonstrated that they're using the same structures in their brain to recognize threats and rewards as we would. Marsluff's research has also shown that crows are highly intelligent animals that can recognize individual humans. Researchers wore a caveman mask when they trapped the birds. Showed that it wasn't just that weird looking face that they remembered, but they could remember and discriminate among all these kinds of faces, some of which are very similar. Months later, long after they were released back into the wild, the crows would react when they saw researchers wearing the caveman mask around campus. We learned that uh, when they see the mask of the person that had captured them, they go crazy, basically. They dive at us and attack and shriek. But even more surprising is how long that's persisted, proof that crows that were caught by a person wearing the mask have communicated their negative experience to other birds. That behavior in the field on campus here has persisted now for 10 years uh, and it's been passed on through the generations as a social um, tradition. So they, they, everybody knows that this guy when he wears the mask that caught them is bad. Who would have thought that I could pet a crow? Crows treat people they perceive as friends very differently. A crow in Vancouver, B.C. that was raised by humans has its own Facebook page full of friendly encounters. Just uh, me and my crow, just hanging out. Yeah. Crows create a huge spectacle each night as they return to roost near the UW Bothell campus. In the winter, before the birds build nests in neighborhoods, 10 to 15,000 of them nest at the Bothell campus where they find safety in numbers. Well, that ability to, to, to work together, now they come together to work cooperatively at night to, um, to survive a dangerous time for them each night. That's a pretty cool behavior, and, and not many birds do that. He was doing that when he was looking at the food and things like that. 
Marsleff is hoping that his current research continues to lead to even more knowledge, respect, and an understanding of these birds. The more we appreciate them and wonder about the things they do, the more we might care about them and, and take care of the world so that they have a place to survive and, and carry out their lives. And to me, that's the biggest message is we're not alone in this planet, but we're in the company of many, many uh, animals that are just as advanced as we are. Marsliff says crows have been known to bring gifts to people who feed them. He says crows have given people car keys, even diamond rings. However, they will also dive bomb you if they think you're dangerous. Okay, now to a story that shows just one more way that University of Washington graduates are making the world a better place. One UW grad shares how he combined his own personal struggle with post-traumatic stress disorder with his UW education to help his fellow veterans. I was an infantryman and I did three deployments, twice to Iraq, once to Afghanistan. I was wounded on my second deployment to Iraq. When I got out of the Marines, I quickly realized that I was struggling with PTSD. The counselor that I saw encouraged me to start growing plants as a way to reconnect with my environment. My undergrad was focused on human services and I spent all my coursework looking at veteran issues and one day it kind of just clicked. Why don't, why don't we combine this agriculture stuff with these veteran issues and use the farm as a catalyst for veterans to reintegrate? Going to the University of Washington and getting my master's in social work has been very helpful. I had professors who ran foundations in Seattle. Years and years and years of valuable knowledge that I was able to try to glean from them. When we first started growing veterans, we were on one three acre farm. We had two staff members and maybe a dozen or so volunteers. Now, uh, nearly four years later, we've got three farms up and down the I-5 corridor from Auburn all the way up near the Canadian border. Every Thursday during the growing season, we have a farmer's market stand at the VA Puget Sound Healthcare System on Beacon Hill in, down in Seattle. To come out to the, to the farm and see other vets supporting each other, taking the, the courageous step to seek counseling. For me, it completely validates that what we've created works. Three-time Marine combat veteran and Growing Veterans founder Christopher Brown has since changed his role from executive director to president of the board of directors so that he can focus on his career as a PTSD counselor for veterans. Up next on UW360, a UW program teaches students how to transform empty spaces into amazing displays. We get a course in museology. And get ready to meet Silent Wolf, the UW student who's paying for college by playing video games. As UW360 continues. Welcome back, everyone. Every community has a story, and the UW is helping many communities tell theirs through its Museology Graduate Program. The nationally acclaimed program is dedicated to preparing museum professionals to make a difference in our world. And you might be surprised to learn what a tremendous role UW students play in supporting our local museums by helping many of them design and display their exhibits. This basket's from the north, uh, is what we were told, and then also like this one has porcupine quills on it, which is pretty cool. So. At the Edmonds Historical Museum, Brianna Brenner is helping bring history to life. I think it's about, you know, being able to connect with the past and the history and people and just bringing it all together into one place. Brianna is working with the museum's director to display an exhibit on loan from the Burke Museum called Salish Bounty about traditional Coast Salish food. 
telling a complicated story through photos and captions isn't easy. And sometimes that's really hard because you're like, oh, I love this story, but it has nothing to do with what you're actually trying to tell visitors. So, you know, just trying to find that balance and making sure you, that you're staying on, you know, your theme. I think it's an important concept. And I think Brianna is in her final weeks of the UW's two-year museology graduate program, the only one of its kind in the state. The ES is kind of set up as a timeline, but not. The program is nationally acclaimed, but a bit of a secret here at home. Whenever I'm like, oh yeah, I'm a UW museology student, they're like, is that music? Is that, are you studying Greek muses? No, it has to do with museums. The program has taught her how to help community museums like this one design and display their exhibits. This is the tradition section. She was also part of the team of UW graduate students who helped design the display for the City of Edmonds 125th anniversary last summer, much of which is still on display. We've been helping with the For Brianna, the UW program was a perfect fit. It's one of the top programs in the country, so I was really, you know, like I want to go there. Begin the process. Her exhibit design class is led by UW professor Wilson O'Donnell. So it's really about uh, storyline, how that lays out within the space. It's a difficult space. It's an intricate lesson in show and tell, with Professor O'Donnell guiding the students to both show a key part of a community's history and then tell the story around it. We are about trying to have our students both assist in community uh, projects and help local organizations move forward, uh, as well as give them the opportunity to get uh, really important, direct, hands-on experiences uh, throughout the community. The telephone company. It was that hands-on experience that changed the course of Brianna's career. I never really wanted to go into exhibits, but this has given me at least a step into understanding how those come together and understanding how they work and I can apply that to my future career. A career which she now hopes to launch at a community museum like this one. It's not about, hey look, I put up an exhibit. It's, it's about, hey look, visitors are actually getting something out of this exhibit. Professor O'Donnell says the museology program is always looking for new opportunities to work with community partners. If you'd like to learn more, just head to the link on our website. Up next on UW360, how the gamer known as Silent Wolf turned his love of video games into a pretty profitable profession, all while getting his degree, too. UW360 will be right back. Welcome back to UW360. We've all seen how video games can take an entire country by storm, like the Pokemon Go craze. And for some folks, gaming can go far beyond mere entertainment. Take one UW undergrad who turned his hobby into a pretty impressive paycheck. Austin Seedentoff introduces us to student and professional gamer Otto Silent Wolf Bizno. When college undergrads consider getting a job to help pay the bills, very few consider playing video games as an option. But for one UW student, playing Super Smash Bros. Melee has been a way to make more than just a living. I have enough grants to pay for tuition, so I'm paying for my own expenses like rent and food and stuff like that. But I've been living off of Smash for the last couple of years exclusively. Although I never planned on making a career out of playing Smash when I initially started. Otto Silent Wolf Bizno is just one of a few people worldwide who can call themselves a professional gamer. I bet when I did that full jump back air, I wasn't trying to be that far to the right. Attending and winning tournaments like this one hosted by UW's Smash Club at UW's Intellectual House is just another day in the office. In a sense, there are a lot of parallels between being a competitive gamer and let's say like a professional like basketball player or something, a lot of the mentality is there. Like certain aspects like not getting too comfortable when you get a lead and how to fight that. <laughs> oh, oh, that'll do it. 3-1, the CLG SFAT yep. takes it. 
How popular has this become? It's standard for tournaments now to stream play-by-play -play commentary and, yes, even post-game interviews to thousands of viewers across the world. Do you feel good taking away Sangwool's rent money oh, yeah, for no, this month? Absolutely. We need to pay more attention to that. <laughs> Otto's actually my favorite player because you have to be able to think and execute 10 steps up like ahead of your opponent. Recently sponsored by Team Secret and ranked as 11th in the world, Otto is on the main stage for Melee in the new world of esports. The top prize of $6.6 million. That's exactly what it sounds like. You've made video games into a sport, you've monetized it in such a way that it has like thousands and like millions of viewers and like People like, will like, you know, gather by the hordes to watch people play a video game, right? If you can create some chaos, I'll play off of it. So let's just try that general strategy, and if it doesn't work, then we can just like, free fall. The excitement around esports has definitely reached the UW community. Look at this, I can see everyone! Where a Smash Brothers scene has been steadily growing for a couple of years. I really like the community itself. I think it's just really cool how everyone is so involved and they're really welcoming. I've got to know like all those communities, and I'm like, wow, I want to bring these people together in one place. I did do one like kind of sick thing. I did like the reverse snare, fall through back here. <laughs> Despite the attention that Otto has gotten from his accomplishments, he insists on staying focused on what matters to him. As cool as being a professional gamer is, I, I do believe it's not a lifelong career, so it's nice to have a backup. I'm really interested in science in general particularly interested in paleontology, anything to do with like organisms that lived millions of years ago, what the structure of the earth was like back then, and at some point, maybe a year or two from now, I do plan on doing both at the same time. That's it! What a final stock from Silent Wolf! I can't You're... believe this guy! For Silent Wolf and eSports in the years to come, who knows, just maybe you'll become a fan. Many of Silent Wolf's fans understand his decision to prioritize school over Smash, but they'll also be happy to hear he plans to return to full-form gaming when he graduates with his Bachelor of Science degree. And that does it for this edition of UW360. If you'd like more information on any of the stories you saw today, just head to our website at uwtv.org slash uw360. You'll also find us on Facebook and Twitter. I'm Carolyn Douglas. Thank you for watching. And we'll see you next time with all new stories from the University of Washington.